they're the most storied team in Formula One history. The one that's been around the longest, the one with the most wins and the most championships, the one that generates the most headlines, and definitely the one with the most mystique. But what's it like to drive for the biggest Formula One team in the world, Scuderia Ferrari? Italy, you're driving for a country, you're not driving for a team. To be once in your life a Ferrari driver, it's a very special feeling. You are the one being choiced to deliver the happiness and the enjoyment. It's a cliche to say that uh, every driver's dream is uh, to be a Ferrari driver one time or another. Well, mine was the original dream. I don't think my career, I could call my career complete if I didn't have that opportunity, quite honestly. I'm Tom Clarkson, and on this, the first of two very special episodes of Beyond the Grid to celebrate Ferrari's 1000th Grand Prix, I'll be finding out the answer by chatting to the men who drove for the famous prancing horse. On this week's show, I'll speak to four drivers who drove for the Maranello team under its iconic founder, Enzo Ferrari. We'll find out what makes Ferrari so special, the unique pressures of driving for the team in red, the incredible lust for victory, the famous internal politics, and what it was like to have Enzo Ferrari as a boss. So get ready for plenty of fabulous anecdotes from Mario Andretti, Jody Schechter, and Gerhard Berger. But we'll start with Tony Brooks, the rapid Englishman who drove for Ferrari in their first decade in the sport, the 1950s. His previous team, Van Wall, had pulled out of Formula One, and no other British team had a seat available. Then Tony got a phone call from Ferrari and set off to Maranello with his Italian wife, Pina, in tow. I had a, a call from uh, Tavoni, Romolo Tavoni, the team manager of Ferrari, saying, uh, you know, would I would think about driving for Ferrari? And, I sort of um, wasn't playing hard to get, but I said, well, you know, so I'd like to uh, consider that. And uh, I think uh, I was immediately invited to go over to Italy. Uh, I met uh, Enzo Ferrari in his uh, grand uh, office and uh, had a, a very constructive uh, discussion with him for about half an hour, that was all, and uh, sitting on one side of a, of a, a formal desk and the Pina actually happened to be with me, but I didn't need her help to communicate on, on the language side. Uh, we had this very uh, congenial um, uh, meeting, and uh, he discussed the terms and everything, and uh, he said, oh, by the way, I don't appoint uh, number one drivers until they are participate, participating in the team. We'll see who's doing what in the season that time, in, the, in, in, in a performing in the particular season. So I, I wasn't asking for the number one driver anyway, but uh, he just made it clear that that's how he worked, you know, you had to earn it. And I did finish up with number one driver, but on the basis of, uh, of results, uh, not, uh, uh, not being appointed uh, from the start. It had a certain glamour about Reims that, uh, you know, some circuits don't have. To win at Reims in a Ferrari yeah, was, it was a tremendous uh, uh, sense of satisfaction and... Uh, you know, a great reward for um, uh, the uh, the fact that I'd, uh, if you like, uh, betrayed the British side uh, in the benefit of, uh, of Ferrari. From one driver who had never considered driving for Ferrari to another who had always dreamt of racing for the prancing horse. Mario Andretti grew up in Italy and as a child watched his hero Alberto Ascari win for Ferrari at Monza. It's because of Ferrari that um, I was uh, infected by the uh, racing bug at a very early age, of course, uh, still living in Italy. You know, I would suspect that I uh, became, with my brother Aldo and I as twins, you know, we became enamored with the sport probably at age 10 or 11, early 50s, because of Formula One being so prominent in Italy, uh, obviously Ferrari, Maserati, Alfa Romeo. And then uh, my absolute idol, the first idol became Alberto Ascari. And, you know, it's a cliche to say that uh, every driver's dream is uh, to be a Ferrari driver one time or another in, in you know, during a career. 
Well, mine, you know, was the original dream. And uh, how Im as impossible as it may seem at the time, which it was, but um, something that, that I've never given up. And um, as fate would have it, as my career went on, obviously my biggest inspiration, and a lot of people don't really know this, as a driver, racing driver, I wanted to be a Formula One driver first and foremost. Our fate brought us in a different direction at the beginning, but uh, I never, ever gave up on that idea. I'll never forget my first the real experience uh, meeting Mr. Ferrari. I had driven my, my first long distance race was with one of uh, Ferrari North America, you know, for Luigi Chinetti at the 24 Hours of Daytona. Uh, teamed up with uh, Pedro Rodriguez. But uh, my first factory Ferrari experience and my meeting with Mr. Ferrari was in 69 in Monza for the 1,000 Ks. And, and again, uh, it, you know, that's the only race that uh, obviously he would go to in, in those days. And uh, Chris Amon was my teammate. And of course, uh, I wanted to impress, as you can imagine. Chris Heyman was very quick, and usually I wanted to be the quick one on, on the team because mostly I, I usually qualified. But uh, nevertheless, I'm going out there, and somehow, and she came just before uh, going up on the, on the high banks because that's, uh, you know, on that particular race, we were using the high banks as well. Uh, I, I kind of stuffed it and uh, didn't, didn't really do – any damage other than, you know, it's just some body damage on the front, but I come in and with the car all that's skewed and so forth. And I figured this is the end of my career with Ferrari. And, you know, every thought, terrible thought went through my mind as I came into the pits. And Mr. Ferrari was there with this, uh, usually had his hand right in his chest and his, uh, <laughs> and, and he had a smile on his face. I couldn't believe it. And this tells you, just, he knew that I was trying 100%, and he would never fault a driver that he was a true racer. He knew that I was just trying, so he would never fault a driver that would just try. That's why he was so in love with uh, Jill Villeneuve, for instance. You know, and how many cars did he go through, you know? But he knew that, you know, he was 110% always in. That's the beauty about this man. You know, he was, um, uh, the experiences I've, I've had uh, throughout the, you know, the decades, a few decades that uh, we, um, and, you know, I had the opportunity to be, uh, you know, to be in contact with him. Every moment was so precious. Um, and um, Colin Chapman gave me the first uh, go at Formula One, but uh, as fate would have it, I win my first Formula One race with Ferrari. That. South African Grand Prix in 71. How did that opportunity come about? And then just tell me a little bit about the race and what Enzo said to you afterwards. Well, uh, first of all, I, uh, I had driven uh, for Ferrari, uh, you know, a, a few races and long distance up to that point. And, and of course, uh, you know, I was trying to, uh, to still do some Formula One because I felt that uh, ultimately I want to devote my you know, part of my career uh, to Formula One. So uh, I, would, I was doing it basically part-time. At that point, uh, Lotus, uh, actually, they, uh, because I, I couldn't do some of the races, they hired Emerson Fittipaldi in my place because that Colin would have given me a, a full-time ride on Lotus as well at that point. But um, anyway, uh, so Ferrari, I had that relationship in, for sports cars, and um, I uh, expressed the desire to do, you know, some Formula One races. He said, right. I said, whenever you can, I will have a third car for you. And that's what it was. And South Africa, again, you know, it just turned out to be a great situation, uh, you know, to win that. And, and the caveat on that one was, you know, where the likes of Jackie Stewart finished second to me. I know Dennis Holm uh, was leading the race, uh, you know, until late in the race and he dropped out. And so uh, it's not that uh, I was controlling that race, but the, nevertheless, I was up front, took advantage of that, and it was a good win. And, and the best part is that I was able to back that up um, a couple of weeks later. Uh, at the non-championship race at Western Grand Prix in America, 
but uh, all the teams were there, you know, all, all the Formula One teams, uh, plus some Americans uh, from the 5,000. You know, and, and they were at two 100-mile heats because uh, the Formula 5,000 cars didn't have enough fuel to go the full Grand Prix length. So, but I won both of those, you know, and Jackie Stewart finished second twice. So I think that part impressed them, actually, to have um, – and, and that's why I was offered uh, a full seat as a one later on that year in 71. What did he say to you when he won a race? Did he go all Chip Ganassi and I love winners? Or did he have a particular way of expressing himself? Well, with him, it's always, you could, uh, you could see this. Uh, there was a smile of approval, you know, that uh, he was, uh, uh, Mr. Ferrari was uh, very controlled. His emotion is, uh, just to get a smile from him was, was huge. The demands of uh, the Ferrari team are perhaps different, especially when Mr. Ferrari was there, you know, that he wanted the drivers to be around, to be checking in and, and, and be at the factory. I know that every time I visited, drivers were always there. And um, so he wanted to have the driver totally committed, you know, to, uh, to the job, not just uh, on a race weekend, but, uh, you know, throughout the week. And that's something that uh, I thought it was very different, very special. Are you ready for some breaking news? This important message is brought to you by Manscaped.com. After more than 18 months of research and development, the Manscaped engineering team has confirmed that they have successfully created the greatest personal hair trimmer ever. This new trimmer has just been released in the UK and we are the first to confirm that the new and improved Lawnmower 3.0 Manscaped trimmer is now available for purchase. Their third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to advanced skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped and has been upgraded to a 7000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology. The battery life is incredible and will last up to 90 minutes, coming armed with a rapid charging dock powered by USB. If you're listening to me speak right now, you are one of the first people to hear about this product and I urge you to experience it firsthand for yourself. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code GRID at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com using the code GRID. In the meantime, let's get back to our celebration of all things Ferrari. Andretti will always be remembered with huge affection by Ferrari's legendary Tifosi, as will Jody Schechter, who was crowned world champion in red at Monza in 1979. It was a far cry from life in South Africa for a man who grew up with no knowledge of the team. I never wanted to drive for Ferrari. In my hometown, they didn't have Ferraris. My dad was an Alfa Romeo dealership, so I never knew what Ferrari was, you know? So when I came over, I worked with McLarens and stuff like that, and they said, don't drive for Lotus because they cars are dangerous, and Ferrari, they're all mad. Because at that time, at the beginning, Ferrari were very uncompetitive. And then Luca Montezemolo came to me, 73 and said, I want you to drive us. I was earning 3,000 pounds a year, and he offered me 34,000 pounds a year. And I said, no, I've got a contract with McLaren. But listen, I had the best time I had was with Ferrari, from nearly every point of view. Well, the first year with Wolf was, was really nice, but um, I loved being at Ferrari. I first went up, they asked me to come up when I was driving for, I think Wolf, I think, yeah. Old man Ferrari asked me to come up and he wanted to talk to me. I met them in the motorway and they're flat out through the town and then went into this office, was dark office with white furniture, bodyguards and everything. And I sat down and he, the first thing he said to me is, how much money do you want? And then I said, the rise said, I'm too young to talk about money. But I didn't sign up at that time. But um, <laughs> why didn't you sign up at that time? No, he didn't, want, he didn't sign me up at the time. At that time, they, they, they weren't the right circumstances. What happened is in the um, beginning of 78, because I was second in the World Championship 77, possibly should have won it if 
possible, da, da, da. But they came to me like uh, after the first or second race, we want to sign you now. And eventually I said, no, 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 no. But anyway, we signed very early up there. The big thing with Ferrari is that he put people against each other. So he felt, this is my impression, he felt if he puts one person against the other, he gets more performance. So every time I went up there, before I first came up working for him, I always went to his dining room, and he always had his special dining room. Not the, not the way, not the way I could speak any, but he's separate. Dining. When I came up there to work for him, he didn't invite me. Immediately, I had to go out and, and be in the restaurant with everybody else, uh, punters as well. But it, did, it didn't bother me because I wanted to win the championship and that's all. But I had my f fantastic time at Italy. Before I got there, the press were always making the drivers fight. They, you know, they always, you said this or you said that or you said it. And I got on well with Gilles and the team. I said, listen, let's not get into that at all. We a team, we talk to each other, we'll see like that. And that's, and that's what we did. And the press never bothered us. Only once when at Silverstone, they gave me the wrong signal. And old man Ferrari said, come to my office, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock Monday morning. And we all had to go in there and, because I had said they gave me the wrong thing and it was all over the press. Italy, you're driving for a country. You're not driving for a team. Every other team, you're driving for a team. And that's, that's the big difference. Did you feel more pressure as a Ferrari driver than any other team? I'm going to say this and it sounds arrogant. I didn't feel any pressure, but I think it's because I had so much pressure on myself that nobody else could put any more pressure on me to a large degree. I mean, I wanted to win the world championship when I came here. That's all that was important to me. And I did everything I could to win the championship. Can I take you back to that weekend at Monza? You win the race and you win the world championship. How did it feel? It was relief. It, it wasn't, uh, you know, fantastic, I'm world champion. It was just after all these years, at least I've done it now. What did old man Ferrari say to you after you'd won the title? We were at Maranello. Uh, we were, I think we were doing a test or we, I was there anyway. And he walked past me and he said, hello, champion, and walked off. That was it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> he was a man of few words. Well, you know, I, I didn't speak Italian. And um, you know, I always say, I think he loves Jill and he had respect for me. That's what it was, you know. I didn't, I didn't care anything. I wanted to win the world championship. That's all I wanted to do. I was the last driver with the old man Ferrari, world champion. So uh, the, it was slightly different at that time to when he was gone. Although when I was there, he was sort of at the end of his career and wasn't as in control as he was earlier on. That was my impression. But it's very special driving for Ferrari. I would say nearly as special as winning the World Championship. That title win at Monza will live long in the memory, as will the 1982 race at the famous Temple of Speed where Mario Andretti made a remarkable comeback for the Scuderia during a season in which star driver Gilles Villeneuve had been killed and his teammate Didier Peroni horrifically injured. Andretti's performance, taking pole position and finishing third in the race in a car he'd never driven before, was celebrated wildly by the Tifosi, a perfect example of the unique kind of passion the team inspires. Monza, the traditional home of the Italian Grand Prix, all the excitement with this huge Italian crowd here, centering around the man on pole position because the crowd have come, as always at Monza, to see Ferrari. Mario Andretti, the American ex-world champion, has come into the Ferrari team for this race. Remember, he was born in Italy and he has put the Ferrari on pole position. In my Formula One career, my last experience was with Ferrari. A wonderful experience, especially Monza, obviously, uh, substituting, you know, it was a sad situation, but still substituting, you know, for Didier Pironi. I have a wonderful memory of that, my, my last experience in Formula One, as you can imagine. Going back and never had, had driven a turbocharged car before and been out of Formula One that one season, you know, that that whole season, 82, 
just to be cold turkey in that, and then uh, put it on pole against uh, Nelson Piquet, who was really right on, you know, with his bravo. Uh, I thought it was, uh, these two really stack up. I mean, they're almost equal to me. And the fact that uh, my last experience in Formula One was that positive and with Ferrari, no less, is huge. I'm just so thankful that I have those memories. Truth be told, the 1980s was not the greatest decade for the prancing horse, with the team failing to win a driver's title for the first time in its existence. Gerhard Berger arrived at the team in 1987 after they'd endured a winless 1986. He'd go on to become a Ferrari legend, securing one of the team's most famous victories on home soil in 1988, just weeks after Enzo Ferrari's death. When he joined the Scuderia, he was already a Grand Prix winner. But driving for Ferrari was unique. To be once in your life a Ferrari driver in the way as you are running Formula One and maybe can win races, it's a very special feeling. Uh, I, I've been lucky to be able to get uh, this chance and uh, I used it and, uh, and I have to say my heart is still deeply with Ferrari. You won five races for Ferrari. Why is it different winning for them compared to any other team? Yeah, that's, that's this interesting question. But Ferrari's uh, status is so much related to the quickest sports car, the quickest race car, religion, uh, uh, everything. That's, it's, in the whole world, you know that a big part of the fans of, of the cars or car industry or racing industry it's related to Ferrari and you are the one being choiced to deliver the happiness and the enjoyment and this is something what makes you feel good makes you feel proud of course there's a lot of downsides on it and difficult on it but in the end of the day I love to drive for Ferrari they always treat me like part of their family I love this red car. I, I chose to Ferrari to go to Ferrari totally emotionally and not logical because logical at the time, William uh, McLaren was the team to be in. And I had an offer on the table, but I still couldn't. I wasn't able to say no to Ferrari because my emotion told me that's where you, you, you would like to be. It seems to me every driver has a tale about when they sign for Ferrari. Can you describe that moment what happened who did you meet where did you go did you go to the factory absolutely i think i was the last driver signed directly with Enzo ferrari and, and, uh, and it was quite interesting i remember there was this race in Imola. i overtook stefan johansson mr bennett on halfway on the grass and something something made ferrari finally calling me and uh, i remember i was still low living in a 60 square meter flat uh, outside parked an old audi <laughs> i got a telephone call of uh, of Marco Piccinini and say, well, Mr. Ferrari would like to talk with you. <laughs> that's up in the Austrian mountains. So I said, well, that's a good call. And uh, yeah, when, where? And I, I went to Maranello by car with my Audi and we met on a petrol station and, uh, and uh, Marco picked me up and put me in the back of a car and covered me with a sheet and brought me direct into the Ferrari environment and, and to the office of Mr. Ferrari. And it was like, like you always read, you know, it was a very dark room, a couple of candles, and they were sitting in Ferrari behind the desk and, and waiting for me. And on one side, I had, uh, and I still remember, on the left side was Marco Piccinini, and the right side of me was Piero Lardi, his son. And the first question of Enzo Ferrari was, do you have a manager? And I said, no, I don't have a manager. So he says, well, that means if we agree today, we can sign it. And I say, yes, yeah, yeah, we can. And I, I didn't expect so quick. I thought it, it just start to know a little bit how I am and, and, and build up some mind. But he had clear in his mind, he, he wants to sign me up. Obviously, he just spoke Italian. I didn't speak Italian. So everything was translated by Marco Piccinini. So today I have to say I have no idea if he really translated the right things. <laughs> As I know Marco, he, he, he managed it a little bit uh, in the right way. But however, we spoke then and, and, and I think it, after one hour I had a contract on the table. 
And by the way, if, if Enzo at the time would say, so how much money do you have somehow around you and uh, how much can you bring? I would go back home, pick up the money and would come back with the money. But no, he made me. <laughs> he, made me he offered me good money. So I just couldn't believe that that I was able to manage from, from as I say, from, from my mountains, from the skis down to Maranello and having a Ferrari Formula One contract. And that was the start of six great years with Ferrari. Was Enzo Ferrari intimidating? Were you nervous being in front of him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, he had this, or, or let's say this way, you know, once you sit in front of this dark room with the candles, and it, it's, it's very, very special. And you read it already before about it and, and, and you know that he is one of the, the big, or he's maybe the biggest guy in the sport. And when you sit in front of him, actually you, you say 99% just yes, whatever he wants to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, this brings me on to Monza 88. Senna! Michael Senna spins! And into the lead goes Berger, into second place goes Alvareto. What a fantastic situation! I am surrounded by a bunch of cheering, gesticulating, shouting, overjoyed Italians, and the atmosphere is unbelievable. We are not only going to see a Ferrari win in Italy, we're going to see one finish second. And the first Italian Grand Prix since the death of the great Enzo Ferrari has seen his beloved Scarlet Cars from Maranello honour his memory with first and second places. And it's a truly happy crowd. He died, what, two weeks before the race. It's a Ferrari 1-2 led by you. Can you just describe the scenes, the emotions after that achievement? We, we have to remember that in this year, McLaren won every single race. Uh, McLaren was dominating and uh, Ron just was already celebrating that every race in this, in this year was won by Ferrari. Thanks God I could, <laughs> I could, <laughs> I could stop this celebration. <laughs> but uh, I went to Maranello just a couple of days before Monza, on the way to Monza, and, and we stay in front of the cars and Piccinini said to me, uh, Piero, what are we going to do this weekend? I say, what should we do? Of course we win. And that was kind of a joke because everything was won by, by McLaren. And they say, oh yes, you tell us you're going to win? And I say, if you tell me that after the car, I own the car? Yes. <laughs> and they say, yes, we give you the car if you win this race. <laughs> so, so here we are. I have to go to Monster to win this bloody race. <laughs> and, uh, and we went to Monster and we won the race. And obviously it was a great day because it was the first win after Mr. Ferrari died. And it was a great day because after the race, I, I brought the car with me home. <laughs> and I had a Ferrari at home. But usually the same. It took, I was for one day extremely happy. The day after, I said already, how can I make some money out of this car? So I sold the car straight away to make some money. And uh, I, reg I still regret it today that I sold it, but I know it's, I, I think it's in the right hands. It's in Bernie Eccleston hands. It ended up somewhere there. <laughs> so that was my Ferrari weekend uh, where we won after it tonight. And it was, if you look to the, to the pictures, it was unbelievable because the people start to break down all the fences and run into the start finish grid and stayed in front of the podium. And I, I remember still looking down. And I saw people in the front, they couldn't breathe anymore because the people from the back was pushing and pushing. And then it was an unbelievable atmosphere. And it was one of my big days in Formula One. We'll be right back with our Ferrari special after this short message. For any of our listeners looking to brush up on their linguistic skills or perhaps learn a new language from scratch, let me introduce you to Babbel. Babbel is designed to get you speaking a new language within weeks with daily 10 to 15 minute lessons. That's all it takes. There are 14 languages to choose from, including French, Spanish and Italian, to name a few. It's available as an app or online. So no matter where or when you log on to a lesson, your progress will be synced across all devices and can be completed at your own pace at a time that suits you. And what really sets Babbel apart is that it's created by more than 100 language experts, so you're not reliant on translation machines. 
You learn through interactive dialogue that mirrors what you might encounter out in the real world. And the speech recognition technology really helps you focus on your accent and pronunciation. Right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months free with a purchase of a six-month subscription with the promo code GRID. So go to babbel.co.uk slash play and use the promo code GRID on your six-month subscription. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot co dot UK slash play. Promo code GRID. Right, let's dive into the final part of the show. It wasn't all success for Berger at Ferrari, however. In 1989, he suffered a massive crash at Ferrari's other home race at Imola, his car consumed by flames. That he survived was a testament in part to the strength of designer John Barnard's composite chassis, but it showed Berger another side of the team as well. Thanks to John's knowledge on composite materials and, and the way how to build chassis, he built in this 89 car an extremely safe chassis because I went into the better and one straight ahead on this 280 case, 200 kilo fuel in the back and nearly straight on into a baton wall and I still survived. And this was just because our car was extremely safe and that's thanks to the engineering. And uh, so I, I have to say, of course I was lucky, but, but also there was behind some, some quali Ferrari quality work. The bad side is, yeah, front wing broke. Uh, a front wing broke and that was the cause of the accident. But saying this, I mean, what, what in Imola we used all to do is let them came through cutting chicans and using the curbs hut. And these curbs gave a big bang to the front wing all this. And that's why my front wing broke. And that's why most probably also the front wing of, of Ratzenberger broke just a uh, hundred meters later. That's something related also to the way how we, we used the truck there. Then, of course, I remember I, I had um, this terrible accident. And I, for, I was unconscious for a short time, maybe a, whatever minute or two, whatever it was. So really being in the fire, I, I don't remember. I remember again then when I opened my eyes, uh, our Professor Sid Watkins was sitting on my chest trying to put this tube into my mouth to make me breathe, but he couldn't really fit it in and, and just made just say, well, <laughs> leave it. We survive in another way. And then uh, I had quite a lot of pain because with this explosion, this kind of fuel what we used was very chemical at the time and, and, and all my body was in this fuel. It was burning and hurting a lot. But I survived. And again, I have to say I survived because it was quality-wise, safety-wise, a really good standard of Ferrari had in the 1989 car. And as far as the Tifosi viewed you, did somehow having that accident, returning from it so quickly, do you think you went even higher in their estimation? You were even more of the sort of Ferrari magical driver that they wanted? Uh, no, first, I think you, you, we have to go back to your question before, because the end, how was your support after the accident of Ferrari? Yeah. Forget it, zero support. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, Fiori was the team manager. He was in love with, uh, what was the name, Larini, or uh, one of the Italian drivers. And it was the perfect moment to put him into the car, you know. And you could see his wish was that I would stay out for the next 12 months with sperm fingers. And, and the, it's the usual Ferrari story. I mean, whenever you hurt yourself there, it is very limited support. What you have to do. They're already in the next stage, you know. And, and, and that's what I felt too, you know. I felt, well... They are quite happy at the moment, you know. But it was nothing to do with the, with the, with the fans. It nothing to do with maybe with, with, with Fry itself. It, it, it was just interests, internal interests. And, and, and yeah, I, I, let's say I fit, didn't feel 100% well with it, but I could cope quite well with it. I said, well, I'm going to take uh, one race and then I'm, I'm in again. Wow. Good old Fiorio. And then just with the fans, Gerhard, I remember you turning up, was it in Monaco, getting a, a hero's welcome 
Yeah, yeah, very much, very much. And that was Ferrari, you know, when you have one of the Ferraris and you survive an accident or you win a race or you win a championship, it's just mm. an unbelievable support you get. Why did it come to an end? Why did part one come to an end? Why didn't you stay there for 1990 or did you choose to leave to go to McLaren? No, I chose twice. I think I was one of the few drivers chose not one them twice to leave Ferrari. It was... Uh, that was usually uh, 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 something you 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 was not allowed to do. When you are when you're in the Ferrari family, they tell you when you are not anymore in the family, and not you tell me. I think the only guy I did it also was Nicky over there. But why did I do it? I was three years with Ferrari, and for some reason I felt I would like to have another challenge. I would like to to see a McLaren. I had an offer on the table again. I think from Williams, from Ferrari, and from McLaren, and I chose for McLaren because. McLaren was another company I always liked. I liked the people was uh, was uh, involved. I mean, when I'm talking about Ron before and something, I mean, Ron was always, when I was working for them, always a good guy to me. You know, he always supported me. He brought me into the team. So nothing to say on my side wrong at this time to, to about Ron. And then, of course, uh, I got introduced by Monsu, to Monsu, to the, the owner, and I felt very, I felt very good with, with this group of people. And, uh, and I said, well, I, after three years, I, I like a new challenge. And I decided to leave Ferrari, and I remember, I don't remember anymore who was the manager, I think it was Fiorio, or, and I remember Luca Monticello came to Ferrari from Torino to have a discussion with me. And he put me in the office and said, well, together with, and he was very close at the time with, with Johnny and Yelly, and, and he said, well, we would like that you, you don't move, you stay. But I decided in my mind already to go to McLaren, and, and I said, no, I, I, I will leave. And Luca, obviously, was the one that brought, Luca, Luca and Nicky was the two that brought me back three years after again. But at this time, I just, I just felt I need a new, a new wife. Berger did indeed return and win more races for Ferrari in the 90s. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have regrets about his time at the team. Driving for Ferrari left a lasting impression on the Austrian, as it did with Schechter and Andretti, with the team still occupying a big part in all three drivers' hearts today. I regret very much that I just didn't do what I had to do to go and start to study Italian. Because to talk with them direct, it would be the great thing. But me, lazy as I am, I decided not to. And it was a big mistake because as Austrians, and, and I'm just a couple of kilometers from the border, we are very close to Italians. Even my parents been been, been born in the, in the, on the other side, and on, on the city hall side, on the Italian side. And so... Our culture fits very well with the Italian culture. We are all spending holidays there and so on. So I think I fit it quite very well in this environment. And I, and, and I always had the feeling they love me and, and I always love them. And everything, if the restaurant, if the way how they talk, the way how they dress, the way how they build cars. I just felt always very close to this country. In all my career, I just could never say that, that they let me down. They always been behind me in good times, bad times. Even... If the Italians, of course, when you when you are when you're in trouble, uh, they are sometimes a bit dangerous to change us. But <laughs> but in my case, it was it was okay. And still, to the, uh, until today, I always had the feeling they liked me to see me in Ferrari, and and they liked what I did there. Of course, we never won the championship. It's a pity, but uh, as we can see now, that uh, some other champions what are not capable to turn it around to win championship. I, the Italian fans was was very special. And a couple of years now, a couple of last year, there was an event in in Milano organized by Ferrari, and all the old drivers went there in the middle of Milano. And you could see again which atmosphere Ferrari can create. How how the fans are connected to Ferrari, and still today, thirty years after I driven for them, no other team could break into this onto the on the same level of being supported by fans. Ferrari only started Ferrari at 50 years old. And as you go around the world, Ferrari is so special everywhere in the world. When I was driving, I think it's at least the same now. 
Mario, I, I don't know how you describe yourself, perhaps Italian-American, but when you were racing for Ferrari in Formula One, did it bring out the Italian in you? Well, I always said that, uh, you know, I'm very proud of uh, my home here in America. America gave me uh, every opportunity that I could possibly uh, dream of. Uh, but uh, I always said that, that the passport does not change your blood. You know, so that's something very clear. I'm Italian and I fit in quite well with them, as you can imagine. But uh, I can say that uh, even from the press standpoint, I was Italian if I did well and American if I didn't do so well, so. <laughs> <laughs> Final thoughts. Once a Ferrari driver, always a Ferrari driver? I don't think my career, I could call my career complete if I didn't have that opportunity, quite honestly. It's part of uh, what I'm so proud of and thankful that I had, you know, that those times with, uh, with Mr. Ferrari, I would not um, trade that for anything else in my career. Powerful words there from Mario Andretti. And although things haven't quite worked out the way he wanted them to at Ferrari, you get the sense Sebastian Vettel will feel the same way when he leaves the Scuderia at the end of 2020. For so many drivers in the sport, racing for Ferrari just means more. And I think Tony, Jody, Mario and Gerhard have shown us just that. Thanks to all four of them for their time. But that's not the end of our story. Oh no. Next week, it's part two of our deep dive into life as a Ferrari driver. And this time, we're bringing it up to the modern day, speaking to five drivers who have raced for the Maranello team in its second phase since founder Enzo Ferrari's death in 1988. You can look forward to amazing stories from the likes of Alain Prost, Nigel Mansell and Sebastian Vettel, among others. Before we go, there's just enough time to rummage once more through our bulging virtual mailbag. And there's something about Antonio Giovinazzi on last week's show that impressed many of you. Holly Leonard said this, So surprised by Antonio Giovinazzi on Beyond the Grid. Such a passionate and humble guy who seems so grateful for where he is and the people around him. And honest about his mentality and goals in the sport. A pleasure to listen to. Well, there's no doubt, Holly, that Antonio is a great guy and he's quick too. So it'll be interesting to see where he ends up in 2021. And how about this from Davin Studevant? I'm so glad to hear so much from Giovinazzi. I think I've heard more words from him in this one podcast than throughout every F1 interview he's done. Hope to hear more from this unique guy soon. I think he enjoyed sharing his story, Davin, because it's a great story and an unconventional one as well. And let's go to this final message from V. Lilly, who was multitasking whilst listening to that podcast with Antonio. Check this out. Antonio says it takes one hour to dry his hair. Fun fact, I've been listening to this podcast while washing, detangling, conditioning and plaiting my hair into eight giant knots. Podcast done and I'm still doing my hair. Great show. Well, V, I think you need to speed up with what you're doing with your hair. Look, but that's great stuff. And thank you for getting in touch. Well, folks, that's all we've got time for this week. But please keep the messages coming because we love them. And don't forget to subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next week, stay safe and keep it flat out. <laughs>